Hello and happy Friday to all. Thank you for joining us today for our briefing, Climate Adaptation Programs Across Agencies. I'm Dan Bursett, Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. The Environmental and Energy Study Institute was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide science-based information about environmental, energy, and climate change topics to policymakers. More recently, we've also developed a program to provide technical assistance to rural utilities interested in on-bill financing programs to their customers. EESI provides informative, objective, nonpartisan coverage of climate change topics in briefings, written materials, and on social media. All of our educational resources, including briefing recordings, fact sheets, issue briefs, articles, newsletters, and podcasts are always available for free online at www.esi.org. The best way to stay informed about our latest resources is to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, Climate Change Solutions, and you can do that online at www.esi.org forward slash subscribe. Our briefing today is the third in a four-part series about existing federal programs that deliver multiple climate benefits. On February 8th, we examined the Rural Energy Savings Program at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. We followed that with a look at energy efficiency programs at the U.S. Department of Energy. Next up, on March 29th, will be a briefing about efforts to build a national framework for large landscape conservation. We agree that, the, that we need next generational climate policies and investments that go bigger and bolder. But it also really helps to take stock of what is already working. We're nearing the end of our briefing series, but you can watch the recordings of the briefings and view the highlight notes online by visiting us at www.esi.org forward slash briefings. And today is all about climate adaptation programs. Climate change is affecting communities and ecosystems across the country more frequently and with greater severity than ever before. Congress has established and funded over many years a number of federal adaptation programs, including those administered by the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, the Army Corps of Engineers to help communities understand the science, identify solutions, and implement the necessary adaptations. Climate adaptation and resilience is a major area of emphasis in our work at ESI. Less than a month ago, the latest report released as part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's sixth assessment report provided a grave assessment of climate change impacts and the feasibility of different adaptation strategies. Even if we had enacted new policies and investments yesterday that would put us on a path to limit global warming by 1.5 degrees Celsius, we would still be dealing with climate change for years and decades because of the greenhouse gas emissions already in the atmosphere. So we will need to advance a comprehensive set of climate adaptation and resilience solutions to withstand these effects, especially where those impacts disproportionately affect vulnerable frontline and environmental justice communities. And speaking of environmental justice, on April 8th, we will convene a terrific panel to take stock of the Justice 40 initiative. So that is something you won't want to miss. So I encourage everyone to RSVP today. Over the course of 2019 and 2020, we organized a 16 part congressional briefing series about coastal resilience issues that featured success stories and innovative approaches from US coastal communities from Hawaii to Maine and from Alaska to Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands. From those briefings, we organized the various findings uh, presented by more than 40 panelists into a major report uh, released last in November 2020 uh, that featured 30 specific policy recommendations for Congress to, to consider. This report, A Resilient Future for Coastal Communities, is built around six guiding principles that generally inform our approach to climate adaptation and resilience. Of those, two principles are worth mentioning today. First, that the federal government should take a leadership role to ensure that intra and interagency coordination helps states, local governments, and tribes access available coastal resilience resources. And second, that climate adaptation and resilience work should complement and contribute to a decarbonized clean energy economy. These principles still motivate us, and our panel today will help us understand what is already underway. You can access our report by visiting us online, of course. To help us get off of the best possible start, uh, we are joined today by Representative Scott Peters. Representative Peters serves the 52nd District of California and sits on the Energy and Commerce Committee, the Budget Committee, and the Joint Economic Committee. Representative Peters is a civic leader who has made improving the life and Sandy, quality of life in San Diego his life's work. He's ranked the fourth most independent Democrat in Congress, uh, and he understands that business problems have bipartisan solutions and is never afraid to work across party lines to build consensus and get things done. Welcome, Representative Peters, to our briefing today. Thanks so much. 
Thanks, Dan, and thanks to the entire ESI team for putting this briefing together and for inviting me to participate. As many of you already know, regardless of how successful we are at reducing greenhouse gas emissions in the coming decades, we're still going to face more extreme weather events. In 2021 alone, damages from extreme weather in the United States exceeded $145 billion, compared to just $28.6 billion during my first year in Congress in 2013. In my home state of California, we're battling more intense and frequent wildfires, extreme heat, and devastating droughts. And wildfires are particularly worrisome because they not only are becoming more extreme due to climate change, they're also contributing to climate change through the release of carbon dioxide and super polluting black carbon. Last year, we passed the historic Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And that bill included much needed investments to modernize the nation's roads, bridges, railways, transit, energy systems, broadband, and other critical infrastructure projects. And notably for this conversation, the bill will invest nearly $50 billion in climate resilience, making it the largest climate resilience, resilience legislation in history. To build our, on our successes in that bill, I introduced the Bipartisan National Climate Adaptation and Resilience Strategy Act earlier this year with Representative Maria Salazar from Florida and U.S. Senators Chris Coons and Lisa Murkowski. This bill enhances the federal government's climate resilience efforts and help us better deliver the newly unlocked funds in a targeted, effective, and efficient manner. Specifically, the bill will require the development of a national climate adaptation and resilience strategy, which will ensure a unified vision for the United States government's response to climate hazards. And the U.S. is the only member of the G20 without such a strategy. The bill also authorizes a chief resilience officer in the White House to direct national resilience efforts and to lead the development of the U.S. resilience strategy. Many U.S. states have chief resilience officers. Uh, this is modeled after those successes. We're fortunate to have support from a diverse range of groups, including the Chamber of Commerce, the Bipartisan Policy Center, the Environmental Defense Fund, and the American Society of Adaptation Professionals, among others. And I hope I can work with many of you to push this legislation across the finish line in the coming months. Climate resilience is an issue that can bring Republicans and Democrats together. So please feel free to reach out to my offices with, it, with any questions or comments, and thank you for your time and your good work here today. Great, well, thank you, Representative Peters, for your leadership on these and other climate, clean energy and environmental issues. Um, and congratulations on the introduction um, of that bipartisan legislation. It's really important. We're really, really excited to see it. Um, and, and I think we, uh, and here at ESI, we think it has a bright future. So thank you so much. And thanks, of course, to your staff for helping making your participation possible today. Uh, before we turn to our panel, um, I just have one last logistical thing to go over, and that is, we will have some time for questions at the end of our panel. Uh, and we will do our best to incorporate questions from our online audience. If you have a question, you can send it to us two ways. One, you can follow us on Twitter at EESI online, and ask it that way. You can also send us an email, and the email address to use is ask, A-S-K, ask at EESI.org. Um, and we'll do our best to incorporate your um, questions into our discussion. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our first panelist of the day. Uh, Laura Pettish uh, serves as the White House Office of Science Technology Policy as the Chief of Staff for Science, or Climate and Environment. Uh, and the Assistant Director for Climate Resilience. Uh, in this role, Laura works with other White House offices and federal agencies to advance the climate and environmental priorities of the Biden-Harris administration. Laura, welcome to our briefing today. I will turn it over to you. Thanks so much for the warm welcome, Dan. Um, today it is my pleasure to share some of the many exciting things that we are working on at uh, the White House and across the federal family to advance science and action on climate adaptation and resilience. Uh, it's especially exciting because we're actively using good science and knowledge to inform decisions and actions. And these demonstrate leadership on adaptation and align with some of the pillars that Representative Peters has outlined as being key to a national resilience strategy. Next slide, please. So it was mentioned in the introduction, the IPCC report. There have been a couple of reports released over the past year. Uh, the, the recently released report from Working Group One on physical science basis of the IPCC's sixth assessment report indicated that our world is changing rapidly and radically due to climate change. Climate change due to the burning of fossil fuels, deforestation, and other human activities. 
This report summarizes what we know about the physical science changes underway. It's a report of superlatives, superlatives that are not good news. Highest, fastest, lowest, unprecedented. It's really quite sobering. In an unprecedented amount of time, human influence has transformed the climate system across the atmosphere, the ocean and freshwater systems, the frozen parts of our planet, the land surface, and the biosphere. And to me, the IPCC report reinforces the existential nature of the climate crisis, and it radiates a deep sense of urgency for immediate and decisive action. We have no time to lose, and the longer we wait, the more we must adapt to. Next slide, please. A changing climate affects us all. The impacts of climate change are being felt across the United States. Here's an image from the National Climate Assessment showing the rate of temperature change in the US over the past 120 years. You can see that um, the warming has occurred over the vast majority of the US with some regions experiencing very, very rapid rates of temperature change and temperatures will continue to rise in the future. Next slide. The choices that we make matter, um, the choices that we make now really, really matter. Mitigation actions are those that reduce emissions of greenhouse gases or remove them from the atmosphere, whereas adaptation actions are those that reduce risk from today's changed climate and help us prepare for future climate impacts. This is not an either or sort of situation. We really need to both mitigate and adapt as aggressively as possible. And our climate future is directly tied to the decisions that we make in the present. Next slide. Today, I'm going to set the stage for the panel by describing the actions that we are taking across the federal family to enhance adaptation and resilience. These include integrating resilience into our federal agency programs and policies, providing funding and incentives for advancing resilience, addressing current and emerging climate-related hazards, and advancing usable science to inform and support adaptation decisions. Next slide. On day one, President Biden directed bold action to tackle the climate crisis. President Biden issued Executive Order 14008, which set in motion a number of ambitious actions across the federal government to reduce emissions and enhance resilience to current and future changes. The administration has been moving at work speed to implement this and related executive orders. And you can find out more information on progress to date at the website whitehouse.gov slash climate. Next slide. Uh, I mentioned at the outset that agencies are working hard to try to walk the talk on resilience and adaptation. All federal agencies were required under Executive Order 14008 to develop climate adaptation plans. Those plans were released in October and they're available on sustainability.gov slash adaptation. I'd highly recommend perusing them. You'll be able to see how agencies as diverse as the Department of Defense, Department of Transportation and Health and Human Services plan to integrate climate resilience into their infrastructure, missions, and operations. The administration and Congress have been working hard to increase funding for resilience, as you heard from Representative Peters. Uh, these include, for example, increases to FEMA's Building Resilient Infrastructure and in Communities, or BRIC, program to support pre-disaster hazard mitigation projects that enhance community resilience. There's growing recognition that investments in resilience and adaptation upfront and save money on damages avoided later. And now with the Bipartisan Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that the um, Congressman mentioned, we have a historic opportunity with tens of billions of dollars being directed towards resilience projects. In addition to these direct investments in resilience projects, we are working to ensure that agencies integrate climate considerations across multiple programs and projects in that legislation to ensure that the infrastructure we build today with this funding will be resilient to the climate of tomorrow. Importantly, the administration is centering equity in these efforts by ensuring that funding flows to disadvantaged communities, recognizing that they are often the most impacted by climate change and may also lack capacity to plan and adapt. Resilience has been a focus of the White House's environmental justice efforts. And the administration is advancing Justice 40, which it sounds like you all will have a webinar opportunity um, coming up soon here. This is a whole of government effort to ensure that federal agencies work with states and communities to make good on 
President Biden's promise to deliver at least 40% of the overall benefits from federal investments in climate and clean energy to disadvantaged communities. Agencies are currently undertaking pilots to determine the best ways to implement this in practice. Next slide. President Biden created a national climate task force and that task force includes a number of federal agencies and White House offices. This is one of the ways that we are organizing as a federal family right now around climate resilience and adaptation. There are currently five resilience focused working groups tackling challenges um, including wildfire resilience, coastal resilience, extreme heat, drought, and flood, uh, both in the near term and longer term. Next slide, please. Um, advancing actionable climate information is a huge priority. There have been decades and decades of really excellent climate science, and yet action is still lacking. One of those reasons is that there are a lot of ways in which that government, which that government information has not been accessible or useful to communities. So we are working really hard to try to unlock those data and tools and make information more useful, more tailored for communities to be able to to apply the, that information to their decision making. In October, OSCP, NOAA, and FEMA released a report called for under Executive Order 14008 on ways to improve and expand on climate information and services for the public. In parallel, the Federal Geographic Data Committee released a report identifying ways to enhance geospatial data and mapping tools. These complementary reports are informing federal government coordination and action to develop and share climate services that can be tailored for local use. Communities, states, tribes, and territories have an important role to play here in connecting, translating, and tailoring federal climate information to support their decision making. And this is also an important opportunity for universities, NGOs, and the private sector to tailor this information for use and build partnerships. Next slide. We are also working through the 13 agency US Global Change Research Program or USGCRP. This was created by Congress in 1990 under the Global Change Research Act to organize uh, climate science and global change information across the federal family. USGCRP is working to address science gaps that are key to societal decision making. They are identifying opportunities both to enhance the usability of existing climate information and to address key knowledge gaps that will better enable society to prepare and respond. One of USGCRP's cornerstone activities is the National Climate Assessment. Next slide. The National Climate Assessment is the authoritative source of information on climate impacts on the United States. The fifth National Climate Assessment is now well underway, and the team has outlined five priorities. One, advance the conversation, particularly around what science is new since the previous assessment, NCA4. Um, two, make it accessible to a broad audience so that those who need information have information to support their decision making about climate risks. Three, be creative in communication. So not just be some report on a shelf, but leverage the power of art and storytelling to better communicate the climate science people need to act and create memorable methods of conveying science that allow our audience to put themselves into their own climate story. Number four, make it about people. NCA5 will gather diverse voices and perspectives to improve the relevance of information delivered and show how Americans are affected by climate change now, as well as highlighting some valuable actions that communities are taking to mitigate and adapt. And finally, ensure it is useful and usable. NCA5 will not just better describe the climate crisis, but will provide the valuable context people need to make risk management choices. Next slide. NCA5 started last year. We've had a very broad and inclusive um, engagement process to date. So there's been a federal register notice. We've taken public comment on the draft prospectus. We assembled author teams. NCA5 has the largest author team with over 450 authors. It is also the most diverse author team in history, reflecting America and actually other countries as well. And the teams have developed zero order drafts and public engagement has taken place early in the process. There've been over, um, I think it's 34 workshops that have been held to date with thousands of participants. It's been really wonderful to see. There is an ongoing call for technical inputs on the NCA5 website if you're interested. 
And later this year, we will have a public call for review editors and public comment on third order drafts. Next slide. Looking ahead, there are a number of efforts that agencies will continue to advance related to adaptation and resilience as they implement their climate adaptation plans, make US government climate science more actionable, and enhance the resilience of federally managed infrastructure and natural resources. And importantly, as I mentioned, efforts to reduce emissions today will limit what we need to adapt to now and into the future. Next slide, please. And with that, I thank you for your time and look forward to hearing from the other speakers. Thank you, Laura, for your great presentation. Really appreciate um, uh, a, a great update on everything the administration is working on. Um, I am going to introduce our second panelist. Um, Mark Osler is the Senior Advisor for Coastal Inundation and Resilience for the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Mark's leadership advances coastal science and the ability of decision makers to prepare for and respond to changes affecting the nation's coastlines. He serves as senior advisor to NOAA leadership on defining research, applied science and policy priorities related to understanding and reducing impacts of coastal risk to the public, our national security and our nation's economy. Mark, uh, hope you're having a great Friday so far. I really look forward to your presentation. Dan, thanks very much. Good afternoon or good morning to those that are following along. I'm uh, really pleased to be part of this discussion about NOAA's role within the federal government's uh, ecosystem uh, supporting adaptation and resilience. Uh, I want to share a, a thought off the top before I get into the NOAA specifics, which is that uh, it's a realization all of us working in this space come to sooner or later, which is that resilience in all senses is local in its essence. It is a condition with individuals or organizations or systems work towards achieving and enhancing. And from a federal government and agency perspective, what that means is that it is an outcome achieved by others. It is not a product which can be created and then delivered directly by the federal government. And so we recognize at the outset that our charge is not to solve these challenges on behalf of our communities, but rather for the federal government to bring its human, fiscal, legal, and policy resources to bear in a manner designed to lift up and support our state, local, tribal, and territorial governments in understanding and engaging with these challenges on their own terms, within the context of their geography, their history, their priorities, and their own self-defined aspirations for the future. And in this space, we understand that no single program or agency has all of the relevant science, no agency has all of the relevant grant programs, no agency alone creates and supports the networks and relationships with all relevant decision makers across the nation. And so then our challenge in this space is one of coordination and cooperation. And it is a challenge that requires a deep personal and organizational humility with respect to how we contribute and uh, help others contribute along the way. So with that context, I am pleased to share some highlights of NOAA's role uh, in this space specifically. Next slide, please. And so NOAA's priorities uh, are, are listed on this slide. Um, they are to continue to communicate NOAA's role as a, as a climate clearinghouse uh, more than just the science and the research underpinning our understanding of climate change, but a, a, a home for authoritative climate data that is designed to and delivered in a way that supports uh, decision making on the ground. Second is advancing equity in all aspects of NOAA's mission. Um, and third is understanding that our climate challenge also presents a a tremendous economic opportunity to drive economic growth, uh, climate smart innovation in tech and uh, enhance partnerships, uh, public, private, uh, and across the academic and NGO sector. Next slide, please. And these, these uh, priorities for NOAA, of course, aligned with the administration's priorities, which, which Laura just uh, reviewed for us. The two executive orders uh, that are particularly relevant, uh, which Laura noted, are here on the left. And then uh, the report, which was also noted, is um, Noah was proud to co-author alongside of OSTP and FEMA 
this uh, guide in terms of climate information and services for the public and uh, current best thinking on how the government can advance and uh, help support equitable outcomes on the ground. Next slide. For me, there are two hallmarks of uh, equitable climate adaptation. Um, and there's a lot of words, I'll let you read them. But the first one here is really about equitable access to information and making sure that Shaktulik Alaska has all of the same rich data sets and understanding of how their climate is changing uh, as Boston or San Francisco or Miami have. And so there are clearly disparities today um, in terms of data access and ability to simply to have uh, measurements and predictions of change uh, across the nation. And so a very early identifier uh, in terms of enabling equitable adaptation is equitable access to environmental information. And then the second is really around action at that uh, community or organizational or even individual level. And this is about the equitable ability to implement, uh, to have agency over one's own future uh, in a way that is uh, informed by science and supported by federal policy. Uh, and critical in my thinking here is that there are key moments where decision makers need to be able to calculate and communicate the idea of trade-offs of a do nothing action versus a take action A or the difference between action A or action B. Uh, the ability to make those trade-off analyses are central uh, to equitable adaptation on the ground and uh, must be underpinned by science. Uh, next slide. So how does NOAA think about all of this? Um, and here is a very colorful graph. I wanna invite you to simply look at the column headings first across the top before the, the text on the bottom. What this graphic is seeking to indicate is that there is a whole spectrum of information that goes into understanding and preparing for sound adaptation and sustainable uh, resilient growth on the ground. On the left hand side in the blue colors are kind of the, the raw materials, if you will, the observations of our earth system, the predictions and simulations of our earth system, the curation of those data, and the actual, uh, what are called product lines here in terms of uh, digestion and conveyance of authoritative best state of the science understanding of any part, particularly of, of our earth system. And those are important, important foundational pieces. But there are also uh, further steps on that spectrum which critically focus on that process whereby the science and the data for experts is transformed in a way such that it becomes knowledge for someone else. And by virtue of that knowledge, that someone else is empowered to make a climate smart uh, decision about uh, any choice it, near or long term. And so these are uh, also federal activities um, that are shown in the green, which are uh, technical expertise and funding and performing training and outreach and place-based engagement and uh, iterative co-development on the ground. And so there are parts of the federal government um, that work across this whole space. NOAA's mission is unique in my view in that it touches uh, by authority and statute uh, for over 50 years, it touches the entirety of this spectrum. And so NOAA is responsible and does produce cutting edge world-class science and also is responsible for the uh, local place-based engagement uh, and capacity building on the ground. And that NOAA has mission to do both and to connect those uh, from soup to nuts. And the last column here is evaluation uh, centered on the fact that uh, user needs, realities on the ground, and stated uh, desire for new or different types of information or types of portrayal of information should, by definition, be centered back at the beginning in terms of defining where are our research uh, priorities centered on in terms of meeting needs uh, out for the public. So just a few examples of this to share with the group, starting on the next slide. 
So in the in the blue section of that spectrum, which are just the data and the products, there are a couple of resources that I want to highlight for this community, uh, for those that that are not uh, aware of them yet. But th there's of course the climate.gov. This is an authoritative clearinghouse uh, of what we know about how our Earth system is changing, uh, divided in many cases by a component of the Earth system, as depicted by the different graphics on the slide. And so this is a great place to browse and understand uh, the way in which our climate is changing and how it may be changing uh, in the future. There are also uh, connected to this uh, application guides and climate resilience toolkits and, and a sort of uh, insight on how to apply this information once it's uh, known to exist and understood. Next slide uh, is highlighting um, an interagency uh, public private sector partnership that is is a hallmark of federal success in terms of uh, drought.gov and uh, which is is run by uh, and, and shepherded by the NIDIS program in the top right, which is a national integrated drought information system. So this is NOAA uh, in concert with uh, a host of federal agencies, including EPA, the Army Corps, uh, but also health, health and Human Services, CDC, Agriculture, and on. Uh, also partnerships with the Western Governors Association and private sector, uh, which is a, a co-creation in order to track and monitor, forecast, and communicate drought conditions across the United States. Uh, next slide, please. Another example that uh, folks working in the civil infrastructure space may recognize is NOAA's Atlas 14, which is an authoritative uh, climatology of precipitation. Uh, we know uh, by anecdotal evidence and also scientifically that there are changes afoot with respect to the intensity and frequency of rainfall across the United States, both associated with uh, hurricanes and tropical storms, but also um, just in terms of regular uh, non-cyclonic storms. And so NOAA's Atlas 14 is a, is a nationally significant resource uh, and has been uh, identified within the infrastructure bill uh, for advancement and funding in terms of uh, directly uh, continuing to modernize and make sure that Atlas 14 is up to date for the entire nation at the same time. Uh, the last resource I wanted to share is on the next slide. And it's part of a community of resources uh, that are near and dear to me being a coastal guy is NOAA's Digital Coast, which is a whole host of uh, coastal related data. Um, can be land cover, uh, can be in this case sea level rise where there is a viewer that helps you map out and visualize the extent of sea level impacts uh, under different scenarios. And uh, this is another type of tool. This is applied science that, um, in terms of helping make sea level information be understandable and accessible and relevant to place-based discussions. So I, I want to pivot here. So that's a quick dashboard tour of some of the, the jewels in NOAA's crown in terms of authoritative data, which are kind of in that blue section of the value spectrum. I want to highlight very quickly two case studies that illustrate NOAA's work kind of in the green section, which is the capacity building and communication. And the first is in relation to the recently released interagency uh, technical report on sea level rise. On February 15th, uh, the federal government updated its projections of sea level rise for all U.S. states and territories uh, for the first time since 2017. Uh, which was, that's a, that's a big deal. It a, represents an important uh, scientific contribution, both to this broader resilience and adaptation discussion nationally, but also it, it will serve as a key input into the fifth national climate assessment that Laura mentioned. The part I wanna highlight that I am particularly excited about this is that from the beginning, that very technical report, which is authored by some of our nation's very best sea level rise scientists, it's a science report. But um, from early on in the process, we have no able to convene a group of non-science practitioners, folks whose real world job is to guide local communities through uh, adaptation and resilience planning discussions. 
and we embedded those folks in with the technical authors in a way that really had never been done before. And so they didn't get a say on what the science was, but they got a say in terms of how the science was described or portrayed in a chart uh, in terms of uh, advancing the ability of the technical report to be digestible and understood by folks who will need to use it. And in a complementary fashion, uh, not quite finished, but pending soon, that same group of practitioners is non-federal practitioners. They are writing their own application guide for practitioners by practitioners of how to digest and implement the science from the sea level rise report. And again, we have the lead authors from the science report team in partnership with the practitioners. Again, the scientists don't have a say in this, but they are there to answer questions and make sure the description of the science in the application guide is exactly uh, accurate in this. So this is a tremendously inspiring example of co-production uh, and co-communication in terms of really making an effort to ensure that there are there is no daylight between the science, the application of that science on the ground and those that need to live in that space that connects the two. Uh, next slide highlights a second example. Uh, again, this is from the NIDIS and the, the drought work. Uh, this is a good example of a longstanding discussion uh, with a particular river basin, in this case, the Apalachicola, Chattahoochee, and Flint uh, River Basin Drought and Water Dashboard. And so uh, users, uh, federal, tribal, state, and local users, along with multi agency uh, equities within this region of the country have got together to understand what more do we need to know about drought and forecasting drought and communicating. And based on that input, the, the drought.gov team essentially created a, a custom dashboard to meet that needs as defined by the users of the information. So another really inspiring example of co-creation and uh, something I'm very proud of, of of NOAA connecting the dots across that entire spectrum from science to service. And then the last slide, I just want to end with a couple highlights in terms of uh, improving and opportunities uh, for where we might go next. For those of the that may be aware, one of the carry-on effects of the executive orders from early in this administration is the re-implementation of the federal flood risk management standard, which is a requirement that um, that governs the ways in which federal money are spent in a floodplain and, and uh, seeks to raise the standard of care in, in terms of uh, ensuring that we're not putting federal money and investing it in areas that are at high risk. And there is a component of the federal flood risk management standard that invites federal agencies uh, to ensure that there is a climate informed science analysis in relation to the federal expenditure. And that is a, a tremendously a salient and time sensitive example of bringing climate science to bear in service of the incredible amount of money that is queued up within a, a host of federal grant programs, uh, including FEMA and HUD, uh, inclusive of the Army Corps of Engineers mission and their civil works excellence. And so we will in real time have a very exciting opportunity for the government to succeed with its internal coordination on the implementation of the uh, federal flood risk management standard. The last two uh, are perhaps more editorial uh, in nature. Um, I, one of the things I see from my role at NOAA and across the interagency space is that there is often a focus on uh, advancing science and research and measurements of our earth system, which of course I'm, I'm a modeler by at heart. I understand and uh, I'm strongly compelled to, to speak to the importance of advancing the science. However, it, it is probably not where we are lagging as a nation right now. Where we are lagging is building that local capacity to understand and take informed action. And so uh, one of the challenges with that is that it can be hard to measure uh, the success of that. It can also take a long time. That building capacity on the ground can be nonlinear. It can be difficult to have a sharp narrative how this investment today resulted in that exact positive outcome tomorrow. And therefore, it can be hard uh, to gain consensus and action against that need. But it is a foundational need that is underpinning our, our national growth in this space. 
And then the last point I'd like to offer for the group's consideration is that um, there is increasingly pressure on those parts of our federal and non-federal science ecosystem. Uh, there is pressure on them to prove why their research is relevant to the problems of the day. And those that live in the science space know that the pace of scientific advancement is not often commensurate with the pace of needing that sharp narrative. It takes place over many years, many decades. And so it is sometimes seen as being out of step with the urgency of the scope and intensity of the climate challenge uh, on the ground. And as a result, we are seeing folks that work in the pure science space, more on the blue part of that spectrum, feeling compelled to work in or find partnerships for a way to connect their work into the green part of that spectrum, which is the service delivery and public facing decision support. And one of the things with, with Laura's support and many folks at OSCP and across the federal space, we are working on is uh, to try to streamline the dialogue so that they are comfortable to be excellent at what they are excellent at and have line of sight and receive proper credit for supporting and enabling those activities that happen uh, in the public facing service delivery component of this process. And so uh, with that, I'll be happy to conclude. I look forward to the discussion with fo which follows and um, uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate in the discussion today. Well, thank you, Mark. And Mark, you were just talking about the, your, your spectrum, your continuum, the green, the blue. Well, good news audience, if you'd like to go back and look at Mark's slides or Laura's slides or the slides of the panelists to come, everything is posted online at www.esi.org. So you can go back and study Mark's slides, and, um, which were quite good. Thank you, Mark, for presenting those. Um, and uh, remind yourself of what the different colors mean on that um, very cool chart. Um, also like to share a quick reminder with our audience about questions. Uh, we're getting lots of questions in from our audience, so thank you for that. If you have a question and you would like to ask it to the group, um, you have two options. You can send us an email, and the email address to use is ask, ASK at ESI.org, or you can also follow us on Twitter at ESI online. And if we get uh, in a bit of a crunch and we have to start picking questions, I we usually go with the ones from Twitter just to encourage people to follow us online. So uh, just keep that in mind as you're thinking about how to ask them. Um, our third panelist today is Kathleen Berthelot. Kathleen serves as EDF Senior Policy Manager for Federal Affairs, focusing on coastal and flood resilience. She is based in New Orleans uh, and serves on the Executive Committee for Restore the Mississippi River Delta, a coalition of national and regional nonprofit organizations working to ensure a, an equitable, safer, and flourishing coast for Louisiana's communities, ecosystems, and economy. Uh, Kathleen also chairs their Federal Policy Committee, where she coordinates the work before Congress and the administration. Among other priorities, uh, the Federal Policy Team explores opportunities to secure and expand funding for Louisiana to dedicate to its coastal master plan. Kathleen, welcome to our briefing today. I'm looking forward to your presentation. I think you are still muted, Kathleen, sorry. There we go, can you hear me now? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, at the outset, I want to thank ESI for putting this briefing together and Congressman Peters for his leadership on the issue. As he mentioned in his remarks, the Congressman is a lead sponsor of the National Climate Adaptation and Resilience Strategy Act, which would provide a clear national vision for climate adaptation and help vulnerable communities build resilience to climate change. And as he stated, EDF is fully supportive of this legislation. For the purposes of this briefing, I thought I'd share what we're working on in Louisiana specifically, as our work here is all about adaptation and resilience. Next slide, please. For some quick background, EDF is one of five organizations that make up the Restore the Mississippi River Delta Coalition. We work with two national partners, National Wildlife Federation and National Audubon Society, and two local partners, the Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana and Pontchartrain Conservancy. For well over a decade now, our five organizations have worked together and with local, state, and federal officials and agencies on the restoration of the Mississippi River Delta. And our goal is to secure a just, climate resilient coast where people and nature thrive. That work is sadly not just forward looking. 
For nearly a century, our coastal resources and communities have been dealing with pronounced resilience challenges, all increasingly acute due to, due, due to the impacts of a changing climate. Next slide, please. As many of you know, Louisiana is facing a long-standing existential land loss crisis. A football field of the state's coastal wetlands vanishes into open water every 100 minutes. Since the 1930s, Louisiana has lost over 2,000 square miles of land, an area roughly the size of Delaware. Next slide, please. And projections show that without action, we could lose another 2,250 square miles within the next 50 years. Next slide, please. So it goes without saying that reversing land loss in Louisiana is a coordinated and major priority at the federal, state, and local level to support endangered coastal communities, economic activity, and vital natural systems and wildlife populations. Next slide, please. To confront this crisis, Louisiana has a coastal master plan. First released 15 years ago, this comprehensive science-based plan is a 50-year blueprint that combines projects to restore, build, or maintain coastal wetlands with projects to provide enhanced risk reduction for coastal communities from storms and flooding and provides a guide for federal and non-federal investments. The master plan has undergone, undergone rigorous scientific review, is periodically updated, the next one will be released in 2023, and receives unanimous bipartisan support from both houses of the state legislature. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide uh, just shows some of the tools we have in our toolbox, including sediment diversions. Regarding today's theme, federal programs are vital to the survival of our coast, but they are not the only resources in play. Next slide, please. The lion's share of funding for the Coastal Master Plan so far has actually come from the Deepwater Horizon oil spill settlement. Private penalty monies paid into the Treasury and made available for restoration and protection via the Restore Act, which passed Congress in 2012. This slide shows how the settlements and legislation variously source our funding. For instance, the NERDA settlement was over $6 billion and Louisiana got $5 billion for ecosystem restoration. Our hope, of course, is that you all will not ever see the kind of oil spill devastation that opened the door for that kind of penalty funded response. But when disasters do happen, more routine disaster funding often follows and additional funding from recent disaster supplementals can increase coastal resilience by supporting more ecosystem restoration projects. We are also looking to the IIJA, also known as a bipartisan infrastructure law, to advance coastal restoration and protection. This legislation is the largest investment ever in the resilience of natural and physical systems, and our hope is that billions will go to natural infrastructure projects. Next slide, please. Regarding specific programs funded here and elsewhere, progress is being made towards restoring the Mississippi River Delta via long-term programs within the EPA. Their geographic programs like the Gulf of Mexico program and the Lake Pontchartrain Basin Restoration Program, NOAA's CZMA grants and NIFWF's National Coastal Resilience Fund and DOI's NACA grants. We also will be relying on the Corps of Engineers whose many Louisiana coastal area restoration project authorizations from the, 20, uh, from the 2008 WERDA remain largely unfunded, but we do expect some of these projects at long last to start advancing. In terms of opportunities ahead, we think FEMA's BRIC program and DOT's PROTECT grants should look to natural infrastructure projects as worthwhile and critical investments. A recent report by the International Institute for Sustainable Development shows that natural infrastructure can save hundreds of billions of dollars annually in climate adaptation costs while delivering the same or better outcomes as traditional hardened infrastructure. And natural infrastructure delivers additional benefits, including improved water quality, wildlife habitat, carbon sequestration, ecotourism opportunities, as well as jobs and economic growth at the state and local levels. Investing in coastal resilience is a win-win. It protects people, wildlife, and jobs while growing the local economy and avoiding significant future costs to taxpayers. As we have seen on our coast, the cost of inaction is clearly unaffordable in terms of ever mounting extreme weather damage and the lost lives and livelihoods it causes every single year. For us, it's not about reliance on any single program, but about bringing all these approaches and more to bear on our own existential crisis. 
Thank you again for the opportunity to share our work with you. Look forward to the question and answer. Thank you, Kathleen. That was a great presentation. Um, and that work is so fascinating. Um, I wanted to take a quick moment, um, just very briefly to pause uh, and say that we covered um, um, uh, coastal master plan, the coastal master plan process in episode two of our uh, most recent podcast season. We spoke with Dr. Denise Reed from the University of New Orleans, and it was a, a really excellent episode. And um, she was nice enough to go into all sorts of really incredible detail about how that process is working and where it came from, how it's evolved and where it's going. So um, thank you so much for that work. We um, uh, really incredible stuff happening uh, on the coastal area in the coastal areas of Louisiana. Um, we shall now turn to our fourth speaker. Uh, Cecilia Clavett is a senior policy advisor on forest restoration and fire for the Nature Conservancy's North America Policy and Government Relations Department. CC supports forest work across the US and for the past few years, uh, her work has been focused on forest and wildfire issues, uh, including forest restoration, wildfire suppression, budgeting, climate and appropriations. She is now shifting into a lead role as part of a wildfire resilience initiative and currently serves on the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Federal Advisory Committee. Cece, welcome to our briefing today and congratulations on the, on the most greenery in our backgrounds today. I appreciate that. <laughs> I'm selling carbon credits. Um, thanks for having me, uh, Dan, and thanks for the introduction. Um, I am... Um, all right, I'm gonna share my screen. All right, well, greetings everyone. Um, first, uh, I wanna talk a little bit about the Nature Conservancy. We're a global conservation organization. We're dedicated to conserving the lands and waters on which all life depends. We are guided by science and on the ground solutions so that nature and people can thrive together. We work across 72 countries and we use a collaborative approach that engages local communities, governments, the private sector and other partners. Uh, TNC has a long history of working with fire from federal and state policy development to practice on the ground. And this year we are celebrating our 60th anniversary of our first prescribed fire uh, coming this spring. Um, and today I'm going to talk about wildfire resilience and the associated challenges and opportunities to adapt our landscapes and our culture. First, it's important to understand that much of the North American landscape has been shaped by wildfire and continues to need fire at regular intervals to be healthy and resilient. However, we're experiencing more frequent and intense wildfires because of a century of fire suppression policies, inadequate forest management, and more people living in the wildland urban interface, which in turn increases the amount of wildland urban interface. And all this is exacerbated by climate change. 2020 was a particularly bad fire season with some record-breaking statistics. California, Washington, and Colorado had some of their largest wildfires on record. Over 10 million acres burned, and they claimed 47 human lives. It resulted in uh, $20 billion in damages, but even that doesn't include the full costs of wildfire, um, the direct and, and the indirect costs. Uh, those likely amounted to a total in the hundreds of billions. And smoke impacted vast geographic areas that year, that summer. Um, this is the era of megafires. And these megafires caused significant damages, including health and ecosystem damages, which too often impact disadvantaged communities. And while these wildfires are exacerbated by climate change, the wildfires conversely contribute to climate change by releasing carbon and other particular matter into the atmosphere. This is a complex challenge and it requires complex solutions. Wildfires impact a broad range of people, communities, geographies, and land ownerships, especially across the West. And stakeholders include federal, state, local governments, tribes, utilities, private landowners, nonprofit and community-based organizations. And they all overlap with other critical land management challenges related to water, fish, wildfire, carbon, and public health. The National Cohesive Wildland Fire Management Strategy was designed to collaboratively work among stakeholders and across all landscapes using the best science to meaningfully progress towards these three goals. 
One is the restoration and maintenance of landscapes. The second is fire adapted communities. And the third is response to fire or suppression. As a society, we've invested significantly in response to fire, but have not begun to invest in the other two goals of the cohesive strategy at the same levels. Investments in wildfire resilience, which include both landscape restoration and fire adapted communities, has remained relatively stagnant regardless of the trends and as we continue in this era of modern wildfire. The costs of addressing wildfires are huge, but we need a paradigm shift in how we approach wildfires in this country that includes a whole of society approach. There are so many different solutions and opportunities, all of which are interconnected in how we address wildfire resilience to inc include community fire adaptation. The shift needed is increased investments, resources, and focus on the landscape and community resilience at the same level, as I mentioned, as suppression. Too often on the federal side, the cost of suppression came at the expense of other forest management activities, including those that would help in wildfire resilience and risk reduction. The Forest Service has identified 50 million acres of the highest priority landscapes in need of wildfire resilience. This is across all land ownerships. In a report last year, TNC estimated that five to six billion a year, five to six billion dollars a year are needed to meet the needs of those high priority landscapes and support community adaptation. Our report last year looked at federal policy budget options to scale resilience investments, and we focused on three main areas. The first was expanding existing wildfire resilience investments. This is looking at significant increases to programs like the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program and uh, the Hazardous Fuels Programs within the Forest Service and Department of the Interior. The second category was redirecting other existing funding sources across the federal budget. So looking at programs outside of Forest Service uh, and DOI programs like the EPA, air quality programs, defense, labor, and rural development programs. And then the last category, uh, we looked at expanding public-private partnerships and private investments in other innovative strategies. So in other words, how do we bring private funding to this much needed work? One example is through direct partnerships between agencies, federal agencies and utilities that direct benefit, that directly benefit from healthy, resilient forests. Another is exploring how to increase environmental impact bonds that can be targeted across more high priority landscapes. Each of these funding opportunities would have the potential for supporting many of the objectives for increased prescribed fire, place-based knowledge, and climate smart land use planning, among others. Improved forest management can get ahead of disastrous wildfire, but it must be done at a massive scale, and we need to manage at that scale now. To be effective, wildfire resilience must be based in science, ecologically focused. That includes a combination of prescribed fire, mechanical thinning, and reforestation. So why now challenge has existed for decades? One, the opportunity is just greater now, um, and it is more urgent than ever. That's a big driver. While we face mass massive wildfire challenges, forests can have incredible climate potential. Forest plays a role in climate through protection, maintenance, and reduction of emissions. Forests protect existing stocks of carbon, particularly large stocks in public forests. Um, maintenance or enhancement um, allows is the ability of the forest to continue to increase storage through improved forest management, reforestation, avoided conversion, resilience, and resilience through restoration. And then the reduction of emissions. This is from major catastrophic wildfires by increasing the use of prescribed fire, resilience forestry to reduce fire risk and increasing community engagement and collaboration. So another enabling condition is that we stabilize the forest services and DOI's budget. So back in 2018, uh, as suppression dollars were going up, uh, all the other programs are going down. Uh, so the wildfire cap adjustment that was enacted in 2018 has stabilized those budgets. And this means that agencies, federal agencies are now better able to assess their long-term needs. 
Another enabling condition is Congress is investing in wildfire resilience now more than ever before. We've seen this through the infrastructure package and the fiscal year 22 appropriations. These are significant down payments in meeting the scale of the challenge. The administration is motivated to address climate. We've heard already from my um, uh, other panelists um, that wildfire is part of addressing climate. Uh, the Forest Service has also developed a 10 year strategy, strategy to address wildfire resilience. It is a priority right now. We also have better data that allows us to look at the problem with higher level of confidence and economic efficiency. So sophisticated analytical tools can help prioritize work by directing funding to the projects on acres with the highest needs and that will have the highest resilience impacts. And then finally, we have no shortage of motivated partners at the national, regional and local levels. So collaborating across boundaries and amongst interested partners create enabling conditions to reduce fire risk. We agree with Representative Peters and his desire to develop a whole of government strategy, in fact, a whole of society strategy through partnerships to increase climate adaptation and resilience. This all makes it a great time to be working on wildfire resilience. There's so much timely potential to not only work on wildfire and climate resilience, but the same work if incentivized and implemented properly would have those important co-benefits for communities and their economies and overall forest conservation. With that, I'll pass it back to Dan. Thank you. And thank you. You caught me just as my cat decided to hop up. So hello, Rocky. <laughs> Welcome to the briefing today. Um, well, thank you so much for that excellent presentation. Let me invite, um, hey, watch it. Um, let me invite our um, panelists to turn their videos back on while I dispose of my, or I shouldn't dispose of him. I'll move him, relocate him. Um, some managed retreat right there. Um, uh, turn their uh, videos back on and we'll get started on the Q&A. Uh, our audience uh, q a feed has been very very busy so i'm going to do my best to incorporate some of the questions into our discussion as we go um but i'd like to kick off our present our, our q a today um with a something that i think all of you have mentioned uh in different ways um and that is the idea of ensuring that the adapt climate adaptation work we're talking about is done in an equitable and just way and laura i'd love to start with you and then we'll go through the panel sort of in the order of your presentations but I know there are a lot of, you know, good intentions uh, across, you know, government and, and advocacy and the nonprofit organization, you know, the nonprofit community, but how can we really ensure that this adaptation work is done the right way and by the right way, I mean done in an equitable and just way. Yeah, thanks for the question, Dan. Um, a few thoughts. I think one is that we really need to meet communities where they are. Uh, and connect with them and build relationships and understand the challenges that they're facing, not just those focused on climate change or adaptation in a vacuum, but holistically understanding um, what communities are, are facing so that there can be partnership to work together to address climate in the context of the other challenges the community is facing. Um, so, so that's one thought. I mean, I think also it's not always like, I think oftentimes that those relationships are best built through, for example, community-based organizations and other local trusted leaders um, working with intermediaries, not necessarily having like people fly from DC to try to help communities, right, adapt. I think, again, place-based trusted relationships that are, are built on sustained interactions and aren't just one-offs are really super important, especially when it comes to a topic as overwhelming as climate change, because it's a journey to understand your risks, to work to address them, to try to find support to do so. I think there's a real need, for example, for grant writing um, capacity for communities that are small communities or lack capacity um, or, or are under-resourced. I think there's a need for technical assistance, project management assistance. Communities are facing a lot of different challenges, and those are some of the barriers that I think we see on the federal side when we're receiving grant applications. And it would be great to have um, just more of that front end um, capacity provided to enhance the likelihood of success, which would then, you know, make them more resilient and more competitive in the future versus continuing to sort of fund the communities that have the capacity and therefore are good at writing grants. And that just kind of exacerbates the challenge. Um, so those are a few thoughts. Thanks. Mark, we'll move to you next. 
Sure. Thanks, Dan. Um, yeah, a couple of thoughts on this. One is that I think I find it helpful personally to recognize the reality that the uh, adaptation and, and risk reduction, it, while being a necessity in many cases, is also a luxury. That if you have individuals or, or communities that are, are beset by other social challenges, if, if there's insecure housing or, or any number of myriad things that are really help having folks just having challenges of meeting, meeting the work of the day and caring for themselves and their families, the, the things that we're talking about here become uh, kind of uh, luxuries. And so I, I do think to the, to the earlier mention to kind of all of, all of society, I do think we need to understand um, the role of, of, uh, each of us in that ecosystem in some way. I think that that reality has been important for me to wrestle with in terms of understanding Noah's place in this. And then I'll just share one of many thoughts uh, before we move forward to the other panelists. Um, I, I do think we are undergoing and need to accelerate and formalize the way in which we measure return on investment and what we value in terms of uh, where our investments are going and what they are achieving. Uh, we are very good at the federal government level of dispersing monies and being compliant and doing our best to ensure that they are uh, sound disbursements of taxpayer money. Uh, all of that involves, literally not theoretically, it involves calculations of what is the return on investment. And I think the spectrum of things that we measure are, are uh, you know, very much more, more narrow than they should be. Uh, we need to continue to advance the ability to uh, measure and track and predict the return on investment with respect to ecosystem service function and uh, social and, and public health outcomes. Those are really challenging questions, but I do think it sits at the heart of understanding how we advance uh, this effort uh, on the federal government side. Uh, so I'll happy to pass it forward. I can chime in. Um, agree with so much of what's already been said. And to Laura's earlier point, I think we saw much of this with the FEMA's BRIC program with the first round of, um, of grants that were awarded. Um, it was largely um, well-to-do communities, right, on, on the coast. And so um, trying to really get um, that really critical funding to the communities that are most in need, I think, um, is hugely important. Um, but just kind of bigger picture, I think sad reality is that flooding, as we know, doesn't always uh, impact every community equally. And um, there's that flood risk gap that we often talk about at EDF that puts the low wealth and communities of color at greater risk of flooding and really makes it harder for those communities to recover after a flood or other climate disaster. So we really believe that the policies must address um, the, the systemic inequities um, and work to increase equity with resilience. So some examples would be, you know, a community dedicating funding to low-income communities to address the disproportionate impacts they are facing. Uh, and then echoing Mark's earlier comments in his presentation, um, really increasing capacity within the communities um, so that they can design solutions that would reduce our flood risks rather than having, um, as uh, others have said, solutions come from DC. Um, so I think just the focus here would be like the commitment should not just be about the results, which are, of course, important, um, but the process and community engagements. So it's obviously who benefits from the projects, um, but more so who gets to help design their own destiny. I think it's equally important. Meg can weigh in just on the fire side, um, very much similar to Kathleen, what you just said and everyone else. Um, it applies in the same way. Um, one of the uh, programs in the infrastructure package is a community uh, wildfire defense grant. Uh, it's a billion dollar grant program and, um, and the agency is working to, the Forest Service is working to develop a process for it. And in several meetings that I've had in the last couple of months uh, with partners on the ground and um, you know, at different levels, county level, local, state, uh, and, and part, other partner groups, is exactly what we've heard here, which is um, there are communities that don't have the capacity or the technical um, support to be able to apply for those types of grants. So there's fear ahead of even the program existing uh, to be able to access those programs. So in developing the 
program, it'll be very important to figure out how to make sure we access those communities and provide that support so that they can apply for these grants. I feel like in many cases, federal programs have a bit of a reputation for being hard to, for being inaccessible. And I think the opportunity we have here might help change that a little bit, encourage you know, more communities to look at it instead of something to, you know, instead of something to look to avoid um, or to, um, you know, to be fearful of, you know, really see it as an opportunity. There is so much great stuff coming through the pipeline. Um, Mark, you talked about return on investment and, and evaluating benefits and costs. And a question came in from our audience that I think would be interesting to ask the panel to comment on. Um, and that is uh, how agencies measure their performance uh, when it comes to climate adaptation and specifically the climate adaptation plans um, that are being developed. Um, Mark, we can start with you, but I'd very much like to hear from the rest of the panel as well. Are there um, are there some examples of performance measurement that some agencies are considering for climate adaptation plans? And, and if there are, do you know how their effectiveness um, is, is being sort of prejudged as sort of the right measures of performance? Thanks, Dan. Yeah, I'm probably not in a position to speak to that uh, outside and across the federal space. I, I will say that internal to NOAA, the, the, uh, this piece of this kind of internally involves taking a serious look, uh, using our own information often um, in terms of understanding how our changing environment is going to impact our ability to care for uh, our people and facilities as well as deliver our mission. Uh, across the U.S. NOAA's got 12,000 employees uh, spread across the United States and territories. And so it, it's kind of a, it's centered on a concept of an internal uh, vulnerability analysis uh, in, in that regard. Um, to the extent that it is part of NOAA's mission also to, to track and enable others to, to, to make sound uh, build Ability to navigate adaptation and rephrases, which are kind of local, uh, personal, high trust, and long-standing relationships. Um, which is it's a whole different skill set. It's a whole different mission space, frankly, um, to have folks that live and work. Uh, that literally, it's their job to show up at the junior high gym at 7 p.m. and talk with the community. Uh, there are not every aspect of the federal mission that touches on that, and so. Uh, those are the most, uh, I think, clear to understand uh, efforts in terms of leadership through convening and communicating and, and how we measure that perhaps is the feedback we get from the communities and stakeholders themselves. Um, and the, the continued trust and engagement uh, would suggest uh, where we have succeeded in that. And Laura and Kathleen and Cece, if you have sort of comments on the programs that you cover or that you are most familiar with about performance management, please feel free to chime in. Sure, thanks, Dan. Um, a couple thoughts. One is that the, the climate adaptation plans, they are doing progress reporting within the next couple of months to sort of share some of the highlights and progress, uh, including how do you know that that is progress. Um, there are active dialogues happening around resilience metrics. As you can imagine, it's very complicated, especially given the diversity of missions of the federal agencies. And so it's super hard and maybe not even particularly smart to try to develop a one size fits all set of resilience metrics when you have such a huge range of programs and investments. But as you know, as a question, person who asked the question, I'm sure noted that like, it's important to measure progress. Um, I think that with adaptation, it's also often useful to measure co-benefits. So say you do a big marsh restoration project, well, it's not just a benefit to protect the road, it's also a benefit for fish and wildlife and a benefit for recreation and tourism. And so I think um, holistically capturing the benefits of projects is both challenging and really important because I think we're undervaluing the benefits of a lot of these investments when we only look at, for example, the climate resilience benefit and not the other benefits that that project um, provides. And I might just add on to what Laura was mentioning. So we're, we're doing a lot of work with FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers um, regarding their the BCA, their benefit cost analysis. Um, 
because we think as kind of Laura alluded to, you know, both with natural infrastructure, making sure that you're getting those co-benefits and those are part of the equation. Um, uh, so that's something that we're working with with those specifically with those two agencies, because we feel like uh, as of yet, they have not fully been uh, incorporated into the calculus and we think that they very much need to be. And just to add, I mean, you, you know, you, Laura, you said it is very complex um, to account for these. On the forest side, you also have different types of forest landscapes, different ownerships, and, you know, the, the performance measures are different for around the community versus out in the landscape. Um, and yeah, cannot stress enough the co-benefits of uh, wildfire resilience projects. It's not just about reducing the fire risk, but also water quality um, upstream for communities downstream, just as an example. Well, thanks. That um, really interesting responses. And I'm, I'm sure the person who asked that question is very, um, very grateful for your, your answers on that. Um, I thought that question kind of teed up a, a, another one that um, sort of just looking ahead, um, you know, as we look across these um, adaptation programs, um, what are some things that policymakers are, are thinking about or should be thinking about um, as they seek to improve the climate adaptation benefits of the programs sort of we've discovered or we've discussed today? And Laura, maybe we'll we'll start back with you and then we'll go back through the list of go back through the roster again. Sure. Um, I think one thing that's important, it's um, wonderful to see um, so many investments in kind of shovel ready projects. I think it, it's just as important as we've been noting to fund that capacity building. And so um, that just continues to be a need and, you know, project design and things. So like backing up the shovel ready pipeline and helping communities get to shovel ready and maybe addressing some of the barriers that it takes to get them there. Um, I think thinking about, uh, like I said, the fact that we can't just focus on adaptation, we have got to focus on mitigation. Um, so we really need to think holistically about the climate crisis because it's basically mitigate, adapt, or suffer the consequences. And I think we all really want like as little of the suffer the consequences as possible. Um, and some of these strategies provide both adaptation and mitigation benefits, which is win-win. They're really great, like coastal blue carbon um, benefits from some habitat restoration projects, for example. So anyway, I think those are some things. And then how do we um, not handle adaptation as a standalone thing, especially since all adaptation actions really happen at the local level, but find ways to weave that into our healthcare delivery systems, into our forest management, into our flood risk management into stormwater. You know, there's so many different ways that we can and should be infusing climate adaptation approaches into um, just the way that we are as a country. And I think some communities are doing more of that than others. And there's a lot of opportunity for sharing um, across communities as well. Mark, uh, we'll turn to you now. Thanks, Dan. Uh, yeah, I do want to reiterate, I appreciate it's coming up so much. I don't think we can say it often enough that local capacity piece is something uh, that is, is, is central to us succeeding at this as a nation. And as Laura said, kind of filling the top of the funnel uh, to create uh, a more diverse array of, of uh, shovel ready projects and make sure that we're feeding the pipeline of what are now very substantial uh, inspiring investment numbers in terms of grant programs um, that as they diversify uh, we don't want to run out of locally sourced sustainable sustainably defined uh, activity on the ground so that is one i'll reiterate one of the points from my final slide which is I would encourage policymakers to understand um, that, that there are certain parts of the science enterprise where the, the outcome on the ground is not their mission. And we need to find ways to support them and excellence in what they do and ensure that they are encouraging partnership and connectivity uh, so that their work is uh, coming out and benefiting the public but not asking them to stand up a whole apparatus that is public facing and sustainable and, 
and all the rest. And then maybe I'll close with with one of uh, the, to me, one of the pieces of the lowest hanging fruit that policymakers can advance with respect to equitable adaptation is trying to fill in some of these uh, data deserts, right? We're used to food deserts or healthcare deserts. There are places in the US uh, where communities simply do not have the environmental insight uh, to even start to understand uh, risk and vulnerability, let alone uh, what to do about it. Um, and so that's another place where we could make advancements on the policy side. Kathleen? Yep, um, agree with what's uh, much of what's already been said again. Um, I think another area that we've been working with Congress uh, and folks at the administration is looking again at the cost sharing requirements. Oftentimes, many of the communities that are in dire need of, of lots of these federal funding um, uh, opportunities are not able to come up with the match, uh, the local match. And so I think in some you know, scenarios we're looking at you know, for, uh, for underserved communities, if those matches can be waived, um, I think would, would do a lot uh, to advance our national um, adaptation resilience priorities. I have a, a couple suggestions. One is to incentivize private fi financing. Um, so helping to bring some of those private dollars to the table to leverage the federal dollars, we could result in significant amounts of way more than what the federal can provide to get this a lot of the work done, not just the wildfire resilience, but uh, you know the other types of work that mentioned on the panel here today. Um, support capacity, absolutely cannot agree with that more. Um, a lot of federal agencies, the land management agencies have suffered um, declines in their um, management capacity. And so we need to build that up at a time when we're asking them to do significantly more. And then finally allow for some flexibility to these agencies uh, in terms of timing. And what I mean by that is this is a hundred year, hundred plus year problem that we're dealing with in wildfire and it can't be solved in one to five years. Um, so we need to think really long-term of what that means. That doesn't mean we don't act now. We absolutely need to act now and, and do these restoration and resilience projects right now. But part of it is also thoughtful planning into the future. Well, um, Cece, you gave me a good segue into another question that also is informed by a question from our audience. So maybe what we'll do is we'll start with you and then go backwards uh, through the list. Um, and that is specific examples of how these programs in action help communities prepare for climate impacts. And the question from the audience is, are there examples of where the private sector has participated that have enhanced the effectiveness or the reach um, or the capacity of a, of a particular project? And, Cece, I'll start with you and then we'll go backwards um, to Kathleen and Mark and, and go with and, and with Laura. Yeah, I think we have several examples of that. Um, the program I mentioned earlier, the Collaborative Forest Landscape Restoration Program, also known as CFLR at the Forest Service, um, that is a way of bringing in, uh, it's a collaborative, so you bring in different partners, including the private sector, into developing projects and uh, you know, you're coming to agreement on a landscape where that's very complex and you are required to bring a match, um, not as a partner, but there has to be a match to the federal CFLR dollars. Um, so that's one way. Um, and there are, you know, a couple dozen of those projects right now on the ground. Uh, the infrastructure bill allows for additional funding and the appropriations bill builds upon that uh, in doubling the amounts of projects that could be accepted from year to year. Um, and I'll just mention, you know, one specific project is the North Yuba Water Project in uh, California, where they're doing uh, the utilities are working with NGOs and the state and the federal partners to reduce wildfire risk and with the purpose of um, keeping uh, water, you know, the water source safe uh, for the communities. And I have an example of uh, I think I have that example in the slides if um, we can share that link at the bottom. Um, two thoughts come to mind. One is, uh, I think I mentioned in my uh, remarks as well, NIFWIF. Um, they um, obviously uh, leverage federal dollars with uh, private in, um, as well. And in Louisiana, I know that they have a great success record of um, getting really important projects 
um, getting getting dollars out the door and getting projects going um, and some really worthwhile projects here in Louisiana. And then unrelated, I know that EDF, um, we have a bunch of great economists on our staff and looking at um, various ways. So in, again, in Louisiana, we have a, this $50 billion coastal master plan. We don't have all the funds for that. <laughs> and so kind of looking to, again, leverage the, the funding we do have and so looking at, at new and novel you know, mechanisms for raising the additional funds. So we're looking at EIBs, we're looking at uh, you know, green banks, kind of what would work here in Louisiana um, and obviously throughout, throughout the rest of the country as well. So I think that the private um, component of this is, is critical, right? The federal government cannot fund everything. Um, and so I think that this is a very interesting space that lots of work is, is being done in, so. Mark? Uh, maybe two examples to share uh, with the audience. One is, uh, as was um, as Kathleen was just uh, alluding to, was a connection between NOAA and the National Fish and Wildlife uh, Foundation with respect to we co-administer the National Coastal Resilience Fund, uh, which is co-administered by us, but in partnership with EPA and DoD, but uh, very critically also with partnership through Shell Oil and TransRe. Uh, AT&T and other private sector partners. Uh, the focus of the National Coastal Resilience Fund uh, for those that are not familiar is to restore natural systems um, and create, expand and restore uh, in ways that both increase protection for, for communities from coastal storms and water level changes, but also uh, to improve value habitat and enhance uh, flourishing of fish and wildlife. And so those are those are interesting connections in terms of uh, sector based uh, engagements on these topics. The other example I might give in terms of uh, partnerships and and private sector connection is uh, I, I'm pleased personally to be leading dialogue between NOAA and certain parts of the insurance and reinsurance um, e ecosystem to help them develop business cases for uh, investing in green infrastructure and all so both both on the sort of green climate bond front but also um, to underpin sort of shared industry understanding of the uh, insurance components and the ability to use insurance as a risk transfer mechanism uh, that hey instead of developing this you might uh, preserve or enhance this ecological system in order to uh, ultimately reduce risk and reduce uh, the, the sort of capital uh, risk at on the table for for the organization. So that's, uh, you know, along the lines of what I was saying before about expanding what we mean by cost benefit, uh, ensuring that that is science based and helping industry um, make sure that they're comfortable with the best uh, in class of what the earth science is, so they can do the financial math on top of that. Yeah, and I'll um, I'll take a slightly different spin because those are some of the examples I would have used too, which is great. I'm a big fan of the National Coastal Resilience Fund, um, but I think that also just I briefly mentioned this, but the role of the private sector in this like emerging climate services enterprise is huge. So I think that you know it's untapped potential, and I think that there's really important government information and data that could be customized, like weather services are right for. Um, others. I think the challenge is not having everything become be like a pay for service model because the beauty of the government information is that it's free. And so I think in any move to do that, it should, you know, ideally, we're not just making climate services cost money, especially for communities who really need it and can't normally access that information. So we wouldn't want to exacerbate those inequities. But I do think that um, because the government can't possibly tailor information for every single stakeholder that wants to use it. Um, there's a real opportunity there for universities, NGOs, and the private sector to all kind of band together and help communities get the information that they need. Uh, that was very interesting. And Laura, I think that means you get the last word today because we are just about at time. So um, a good place to end on. Um, I uh, would like to say thank you uh, very, very much to our four fabulous panelists, um, Laura, Mark, Kathleen, and Cece. Thank you. So very much for joining us today and helping our audience understand uh, all about um, climate adaptation programs across the federal government. Um, there's a tremendous work going on every day 
across these agencies. And um, I hope today was an important way to get that information out there um, so that as we're thinking about what comes next, we properly take stock of what's already underway. So thank you so much for joining us today and for your presentations. Um, also like to say special thanks to Representative Scott Peters for helping us kick off our briefing today um, and his wonderful staff for helping to make his participation possible. Um, thank you uh, to him and um, for his leadership um, on, his, uh, on his recent legislation as well. Um, like to close with um, a quick reminder that our final briefing in this series uh, it will be March 29th. Uh, it's going to be about large landscape conservation. And if you read our latest issue of Climate Change Solutions, which was all about land management, you know, or already know, there's just a ton to talk about on that topic. So we're really, really looking forward to that. Please uh, sign up if you haven't already. And uh, if you've missed any of the previous briefings in this series about uh, agencies in action, uh, no worries. You can go back and watch archived webcasts of the entire series. Um, we've covered some really great topics. Um, beyond the topics today, energy efficiency, uh, equitable investments in rural America. Um, so um, lots of great stuff across the, the government that we've decided to highlight at this very important moment. Um, also like to plug our upcoming briefing uh, on April 8th. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we will hold a briefing about the transformative potential of Justice 40, um, as well as the current status of the initiative. Um, very pleased uh, it will be the um, briefing debut of one of our members of our board of directors Raya Salter. Uh, so I'm really, really looking forward to that briefing uh, for her participation as well as our amazing panelists. So please RSVP for that. Of course, you can do everything, including subscribe to our newsletters, RSVP for our briefings, if you visit us online at www.esi.org. Um, I'd also like to um, say one final thank you to Team EESI uh, for helping pull today off um, with um, notwithstanding Rocky's interruption. Um, the rest of the briefing went off without a hitch. So thanks very much to my colleagues, Dan O'Brien, uh, as well as Omri, Emma, Allison, Anna, Amber, and Savannah, as well as our two really great spring interns, Emily and Grace. Um, they're uh, busy keeping track of Twitter and live tweets and questions and all of that, and we couldn't do it without them. Um, we also couldn't do this without you, uh, our audience. So if you have two minutes, um, there's a link on the screen. Uh, if you have two minutes to take our survey, we'd really appreciate it. Um, we uh, read every response, um, and if you had any issues with the technical quality, the audio quality, if you have ideas for future topics, um, if uh, you wanted to ask additional questions, and I know we didn't get to all the questions that came in today, but we got to a fair number of them. But if you have any comments or, or feedback about our briefing, please let us know. It means a lot uh, when people take time out of their day to uh, share with us um, how we could do better. Uh, we will go ahead and wrap there. Uh, we are just a few hours away from the end of this Friday, and I am, for one, am really looking forward to this weekend. It's going to be gorgeous spring weather here in the nation's capital. Thank you so much for everyone joining us today. Uh, happy weekend to everybody and to our panelists, TGIF. Thanks so much. <laughs>